Hello and welcome to another instalment of History Hack. I've got Zach with me today. You all right, Zach? I'm good, mate. How have you been doing? Yeah, not bad. I'm really looking forward to this one. It's been in the pipeline for a while and we all know I love a good bashing on this subject. So tell everybody who we've got with us. So today we have Dr. Kirstine McKenzie, a historian and author who has a PhD in the Wars of the Three Kingdoms, looking specifically at the Jacobites. And she's got a new book out, actually, entitled The Solemn League and Covenant of the Three Kingdoms and the Cromwellian Union. So it sounds like we're up for a nice bit of Cromwell bashing today. We love Cromwell bashing on this podcast. Um, welcome, Kirstine. And thank you very much for having me. No, this is going to be really good. We're really excited about this. Um, I guess we have to start right at the beginning, as ever, for our general listeners who aren't like really up to speed on this period. So how does ruling work at this time? Because we're a long way from having um, a united kingdom at this point, aren't we? You've got four nations ruled by the Stuarts with a lot of differences. Well, this is obviously before the Act of Union in 1707. So this yeah. is before our current arrangement. So it did work uh, very, very differently. Um, with the death of Elizabeth I in 1603, James I uh, inherits the 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 the, uh, the the crown of Britain. Mm-hmm. And he uh, previously was king of Scotland. He was King James VI of Scotland. And he... Uh, he uh, was the son of Mary Queen of Scots, who was cousin to Elizabeth I. Mm. And he inherits uh, four very distinct nations. And uh, so to, to break them down, yeah. basically, uh, Scotland is a fully independent and sovereign nation. It has its own parliament. It has its own Privy Council. When the king moves to London in 1603, the Privy Council and Scottish Parliament don't have direct oversight from the monarch. So he's like an um, absentee monarch in Scotland, isn't it? Yeah, so it's an absentee monarchy. You know, the mm. king's not there, but Scotland is a fully separate, independent, sovereign nation. Yeah. Then you have England, who has its own parliament and its own privy council. The parliament is based in Westminster. And uh, then, of course, you have Wales. Yeah. And Wales is uh, run by Westminster, but there is the Council of the Wales and the Marshes um, that rule alongside um, the apparatus in Westminster. They're really then, culturally different, aren't they still? Yeah, they are very, very different because, of course, in Wales, the, the dominant language is Welsh. Yeah. And uh, they have a landed elite that intermarry amongst themselves. And then, of course, you've got Ireland, who, which is very, very distinct um, from England as well. It has its own customs, laws and cultures. Mm. It has a privy council that reports to the monarch. Um, it has uh, its own parliament um, and its uh, parliament where all 32 counties are represented. And the majority of people speak Irish. And um, they, too, have their own uh, landed elite. Um, that that, uh, that intermarry amongst themselves, as well, of course, by this stage, you have uh, planters and you have people that have gone in as, as planters on behalf of the crown, which, of course, James then accelerates when he inherits the throne. So you've got very, very, very four distinct nations that uh, have very differing priorities, have very different outlooks on how things should be. Um, and, of course, there are going to be tensions in However, Charles I completely messes the whole thing up. <laughs> and by 1642, the delicate balance is severely disrupted and it plunges the three Stuart kingdoms into civil war by 1642. It's not surprising then that gr- uh, groups emerge in these tensions uh, that have their own agendas and want to push their own agendas. So tell us who the Scottish Covenanters are and how they come to be and what they want. So civil wars not only put friends against family and family against friends and friends against friends and countrymen against countrymen, also gives people the opportunity to question traditional governments. It gives yeah. them a question to reset how, in this case, the three Stuart kingdoms are governed. And this is essentially what the Covenanters uh, start to, to, to think about. Indeed, those who fought for the English Parliament um, and... Uh, believed that the king's office in person had been corrupted by his evil counsellors. Yeah. And so they fought 
not against the person and office of the king as such, against the corruption of the king's office and person from the evil councillors who had corrupted the king. And so the English Parliament under John Pym went in with this uh, this mission, this idea to defend the office and the person of the king against evil councillors. However, this wasn't completely new, and this is where the, the Scottish Covenanters come in, because between 1638 and 1641, there had been an exactly similar challenge to, uh, to the king's position, and this belief that the king had been corrupted by evil counsellors, um, by what we call the Scottish Covenanters. Um, and they were the king's Scottish opponents during the civil wars. And they emerged uh, as a result of op opposition to a new prayer book that Charles I uh, tried to impose on Scotland in 1637. And these uh, kings, the king's innovations in Scotland in 1637 resulted in a document called the National Covenant. Mm. It was basically a document which asked people to sign in defence of uh, Scottish religion as it was established and also it established boundaries between the king and his subjects. So under this national covenant the king had a duty to God and his subjects to protect the, the reformed Scottish Protestant religion against innovations in worship and it was a contractual arrangement whereby the king had duties and obligations to his subjects and if he broke these obligations the Scottish subjects were justified to rise up in rebellion. So, in many ways, when we when we think of the civil war starting in 1642 in England, that's not really true. In fact, John Pym, who led the English Parliament uh, in opposition to the Royalists, he had taken a lot of his ideas from the Scottish Covenanters. So that's how they are connected. And this relationship continues until the English Parliament finds that it has problems in defeating the Royalists in 1643. So John Pym decides to uh, to design a sort of uh, joint military alliance between the Scottish Covenanters and the English Parliament. And this treaty or joint military effort uh, to defeat the Royalists became known as the Sondheim Covenant. Right? So can I pick up on what you were saying about the, the evil councillors? Because this is one of the really interesting things that comes across it in the, this period, that people are trying to convince themselves that Charles isn't kind of acting of his own accord. Yeah. And actually, after the Civil War, it's that realisation that Charles was acting on his own accord that led to his execution. So how much do people still cling to the evil councillor idea at the time when the Covenanters are really coming to the fore? Yeah, well, of, of course, it, it being a civil war, you've got people who believe that that that, uh, that royal authority is being attacked by the uh, English Parliament and Scottish Covenanters, whereas conversely, on the other side, you have Scottish Covenanters and English Parliamentarians who think it's the evil councillors that are corrupting the king. Um, and it may be helpful at this stage to maybe outline what the Son League and Covenant, this joint treaty between the English Parliament and the Scottish Covenanters, which formed an Anglo-Scottish alliance, mm. actually wanted. Um, and again, this sort of um, this again gives us context and highlights how dysfunctional, effectively under Cromwell, government in Britain actually does become. So, what the signatories uh, of the Sovereign Covenant actually wanted. And bear in mind, and this is an extremely important thing to remember, Oliver Cromwell himself signed the Southern League and Covenant. Yeah. So he is bound by his signature as far as those who support the Covenant, the Southern League and Covenant, are concerned. So remember, please remember that Oliver Cromwell did sign this document and pledge to uphold this, and I think it's very, very important. So... We'll go through basically what the, the English Parliament and Scottish Covenanters uh, signed up and pledged to do. They signed up to protect the office and person of the monarch and to recognise the right of his posterity. In effect, 
to recognise the succession of his heirs to future King Charles II. Not at any stage did they contemplate the abolition of the monarchy, and this is very, very important. So one of the key clauses is to protect the monarchy, okay? The office and the person, okay? Um, second uh, pledge that they, they signed up for was to uphold and respect the laws, the liberties, and the political institutions of both England and Scotland. So this, again, is very much a joint Anglo-Scottish framework. It's England and Scotland, okay? They also wish to promote a joint Anglo-Scottish military effort to defeat the Royal Three Kingdoms, of course. What happens under this agreement is that the Scottish Covenanters sent, send an army into the north of England to help the English Parliament, and they also send troops to Ireland to help the English Parliament. So it is very much uh, a, a, a sort of Anglo-Scottish military effort between uh, the English Parliament and the Scottish Covenanters to defeat the Royalists. I'm gone. The next pledge is to reform religion throughout the three kingdoms according to the word of God. Now this is the this is the sort of statement that gets a lot of historians talking. The other three are pretty um, sort of um, uncontroversial, quite transparent, everybody knows what these clauses in the Sovereign Covenant say, but this particular clause is the one that causes all the problems later on, not just amongst contemporaries, but amongst historians as well. We still debate what was actually meant by this about how they wanted to reform religion uh, according to the word of God. Now, two English and Scottish Presbyterians, and that included the Covenanters and their English allies, who signed this pledge, it meant setting up a reformed Protestant church on a Presbyterian basis. So basically, you'd have Scottish Presbyterianism um, confirmed. It's already established in Scotland, but the English Parliament would recognise it for being established and it would be firmly within the Constitution. In England, they would erect, they would pull down the Church of England and they would erect a sort of um, English Presbyterian church. It's a classical form of English Presbyterianism. And this is important because historians and others have said that the Scots wanted to impose their brand of Presbyterianism, i.e. Scottish Presbyterianism, on the English. That is totally not the case. England had its own native form of Presbyterianism, and that's uh, classical Presbyterianism, and that's what it was called. However, Cromwell and um, Sir Henry Vane, who signed it up to this agreement, disagreed with this. The word of God. Well, that means that, you know, as long as you're a reformed Protestant and you abide by the word of God, you can do anything you like. So there's this sort of dispute between the, the sort of English-Scottish Presbyterians of what this clause means with regards to affirmed church discipline. And then you have Cromwell and Sir Henry, Henry Vane saying, no, no, this is more general. It just means if we follow a sort of reformed form of Protestantism, that's absolutely fine. But however, even when you look at this clause, it does not sanction what was going to happen later on during the English Republic, which to a certain degree was a bit of, an English, a bit of a religious free for all, really. And I'll explain more about that later. But please keep these four aspects in mind when we are discussing the more murky and corrupt uh, side to Cromwell's character and the falling away of natural and orderly government in the public interest as represented by the monarchy to be replaced by the emergence of government in the private interests uh, around uh, a man or a small group of men, which is effectively what the English Republic uh, becomes. You see, this is really interesting because um, uh, to see actually what was intended at the beginning and what was actually run through at the end. Because um, obviously everyone knows I, I can't stand Cromwell. I think he's slaves and spawn, that's what I call him. Um, do you think you can, are we putting hindsight on it? And I know Zach wrote this question in because he wants to know as well. Do you think he already has an eye on being a leading light when the war is over at this stage? Yes, very much so. I, I do. Do it. 
I was very, I was very pro Cromwell since I was 10 years old. Um, if you've been following me on Twitter, or people have been following me on Twitter, they'll know that the reason why I got into Oliver Cromwell was, was uh, due to an Irishman, due to Richard <laughs> Harris. Quite an irony if you think about it. Yeah. Um, it was due to Richard Harris. And of course, the film Cromwell was very pro Cromwell. So when I was 10 and I watched that film, I really, really enjoyed it, picked up on it. Now, it's very, very pro Cromwell for many years. I was actually a member of the Cromwell Association for many years. And then when I started doing my PhD and started looking at the Presbyterian side of how they saw Cromwell, then my views began to change because uh, they were talking a lot of sense. Whether or not you agree with the religious discipline or, or their, their sort of... Um, their their form of church structure because obviously they wanted Presbyterianism to be the official uh, church of Britain to the exclusion of all others which of course nowadays today we we maybe have a problem with because obviously we we live in a world where there's you know multiple churches and multiple religions so mm -hmm. that's quite odd and it seems very it seems quite oppressive but back then that idea having sort of one church one nation was quite normal you know so so yeah i i saw the presbyterians as initially as oppressive and and i was very pro cromwell pro liberty of conscience equating it with religious toleration and then as i began to look through this for my phd thesis and looking at it from the scottish covenanters perspective and their allies in england and their allies in ireland as well because i did it from a three kingdoms point of view um I found that they were actually talking a lot of sense. And we'll come on to um, some of these aspects, but later on when we discuss the in, um, um, invasion of, of Scotland by Cromwell um, in the 1650s. But yeah, so my opinion on Cromwell has completely changed. Excellent. I love that. A <laughs> convert. A convert. We're, we're on the side of the righteous, Alex. Now, most people will know that in 1649, Charles I is executed, partly because of refusing to accept his defeat and starting the second civil war in the process with the help of Scottish forces. What's Cromwell's role in that process? Well, before we, 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 we kind of get to that, um, I just wanted to talk about Cromwell's role in terms of fomenting division within the, the Anglo-Scottish alliance, because I think that's very, very important, because there's certain aspects of Cromwell's sort of more Machiavellian side of his personality that really does come out when you look at uh, how Cromwell was viewed by the Covenanters and their English allies during the 1640s. Okay, so you could 100% go into that and tell us about the murkier side of his Machiavellianness. Yeah, so basically the, the first sort of accusation that the Covenanters and their English allies levelled at Cromwell was that he was he was a liar. Um, Cromwell had a habit of painting events as how he saw them rather than how they were. And it was really to push an agenda or to brag about his own achievements. And the perfect example about this is the Battle of Marston Moor on the 2nd of July 1644 where if you read Cromwell's letter from the battle, he claims that he and his men had played a pivotal role in the victory and the Scots just played a, um, a supporting role. Um, you know, they weren't, weren't that significant to the battle at all. He, Cromwell wrote his account in his letter about the battle and he sent a copy of it down to London within a day or two. And he managed to get it printed down in London, and his version of the battle actually was circulating London, arguably, before the official declaration by the Joint Anglo-Scottish Alliance, by the English Parliament and the Scottish Covenanters, who had also issued a pamphlet a few days later claiming it was a joint Anglo-Scottish victory. So here you see Cromwell being aware of the power of propaganda. He's writing his letter after Marston Moore, claiming that he played a pivotal role, Scott's sporting role. But interestingly, he sends a letter, you know, almost immediately straight down to London to get printed uh, 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 as a pamphlet, as, as a bit of news. And 
This conflicts obviously with the official representation by the English Parliament, the Scottish Covenanters, which suggests it was a joint Anglo-Scottish victory. And there is something to say about the fact that the way Cromwell actually views the battle is not actually how it took place. The Scots did play a pivotal role in the battle, but it's very interesting to see how Cromwell minimalises this and pushes himself to the front. So is this all about Cromwell just blowing his own trumpet, or is he already trying to kind of push the Scots as a political force to one side? I think it's a mixture of both. I I don't think he likes the Scots. I don't think he liked the Song Leading Covenant um, from from the get-go. He did sign the Song Leading Covenant, but he didn't do it immediately. It took him a few months to do so, which I think is a bit telling. So I think he's already got a problem with the whole Anglo-Scottish alliance, even at this stage. So he's he's definitely um, pushing an agenda. And then a few months later, he is in Parliament and he accuses Edward Montague, the Earl of Manchester, who is one of the key figures of the Anglo-Scottish Alliance. He's one of the very major English allies of the Covenanters. And he, uh, this episode is quite famous. He accuses the Earl of Manchester being lackluster in his prosecution of the war. And of course, that's where the, the famous line is, if we beat the king 99 times, he will still be our king and, and we his subjects. Um, something like that. I'm probably quoting what uh, Robert Morley said in Cromwell. But, you know, that's the episode that we're talking about here. Um, and basically uh, what happens is, is that Cromwell then begins an argument within the House of Commons that the English Parliament needs a new, more um, aggressive force to um, to win the war. And so he starts mooting this idea of a new model army, um, which was a very English force. It's drawn from the, the, the population that support the English Parliament. Um, there are no Scots involved. OK, it's very, very much an English force. And the interesting thing about the New Model Army is they all think like Cromwell. They're all part of this, um, this uh, they're all independents. They all believe that they are part of a, a godly minority mm. who are destined to be victorious. Um, so they're all part of the same thing. So this is, this, um, this call for the New Model Army, the, the New Model Army comes to fruition actually stands in direct opposition to this Anglo-Scottish alliance. So it's not that the new model army becomes part of this Anglo-Scottish alliance, it's actually in direct opposition to the the Anglo-Scottish military alliance. The thing is, as well, is is that Cromwell gets a reputation of overriding due procedure and established norms and values, both within the House of Commons and within the Westminster Assembly. He's he's a bit like um, a wrecking ball. You know, he just... <laughs> well, there's rules, procedures, things that people have to do um, to to get things done in Parliament, um, that is the case nowadays. Um, you know, it's the same with the Westminster Assembly as well. They had rules and procedures about how to conduct debates, how to solve disputes. Cromwell just completely rides roughshod all over these procedures and get straight to the point. And he's seen as a very disruptive influence. Um, and none more so when it comes to the, the reform of religion throughout the three Stuart kingdoms. Um, one particular notable example is when Oliver Cromwell uh, pushes for liberty of conscience, which, as I've already explained, in modern terms, it's rather crudely and wrongly been equated with religious toleration. In fact, this is one of the, the sort of things that the sort of pro Cromwell camp always talk about, he was very religiously tolerant. He he uh, he was you know he 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 was a pioneer in that respect. Um, but liberty of conscience is not the same as religious toleration. Liberty of conscience is effectively allowing others to commit errors in worship and damn their own souls, because people like Cromwell believe that they are in a godly anointed minority, that their 
already predestined to go to heaven. So why should they care about people um, doing things wrong, not observing sacraments, um, having, you know, um, uh, not going to church? It's, it's their business because, well, in Cromwell's mind, I'm predestined, I'm going to heaven. Um, these people aren't. They're, they're, their souls are damned. They're going to hell. That is completely different from religious toleration. Um, very, very, very uh, different from the modern idea of religious toleration. Cromwell was so keen on liberty of conscience that he bypassed the Westminster Assembly completely. And remember, the Westminster Assembly was a body that was tasked to reform religion in England. Um, and he took this idea of liberty of conscience and he went directly to the House of Commons himself. Now, Cromwell would argue, Westminster Assembly wouldn't listen to me anyway, but the truth of the matter is that within the Westminster Assembly, you had Presbyterians and independents in the Westminster Assembly. So it wasn't a Presbyterian Assembly. You had people uh, who were classed as religious independents in there as well. So, you know, Cromwell is just genuinely bypassing the Westminster Assembly procedurally, and he is going straight to the House of Commons and saying, we need to set up a committee on religious toleration. Um, and this, obviously, unsurprisingly, is very, very dangerous um, for Anglo-Scottish plans for a Reformed Church in the Three Kingdoms. Um, because not only is he bypassing the, the structure that is reforming the church, but he's also um, he's also uh, allowing, uh, by promoting this idea of liberty of conscience, he's allowing people to question everything about religion. Forms of worship, church ordinances, key sacraments, um, and he's allowing for lay preaching. Uh, people go, oh, lay preaching, oh, that's nice, that means that, you know, Anybody can get up and, and talk about God. Isn't that, that a lovely, tolerant thing for, for Cromwell to do? But if we put this in the context of the 17th century, it may not be as tolerant as it appears. Um, what it basically means in the 17th century context is that liberty of conscience and the lay preaching that it promoted would allow a shoemaker or a cobbler to preach about religion but they had no formal education in theology or even read the Bible. They would just stand up and you know, say, God tells me to do this. God tells me to do that. God tells me to do the next thing. And this horrified people who were trained ministers, people who believed in church discipline, church structure, the religious sacraments. Um, so people in the, the, the Westminster Assembly were horrified by this prospect. Um, that um, ordinary people without any formal training or even people who had never even were able to read the Bible could just stand up and 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 preach in that sense. And they saw that as a breakdown of societal order and lack of discipline. Um, as the Scottish minister Robert Bailey commented at the time, which he says, liberty of conscience cannot be favourable to the state, which at one stroke annihilates all the acts of parliament. So what Robert Bailey is saying here is not only is liberty of conscience an attack on church structure, church discipline, um, breaks down um, order and um, established ways in the church, it is also a risk to political institutions as well. He's worried it's going to drift across to parliament. And to be quite honest with you, he did not realise how prophetic his words were going to be. And what is really interesting is that Robert Bailey is in London at this time, and he's seeing all this happen. He's one of Cromwell's staunchest critics from the Covenanter perspective, and he's in the Westminster Assembly at this time, and he's seeing what's going on, and he's horrified by it. And it's not because he's religiously intolerant or he's a bigot, he can see the, the church structure, the church discipline all break down. And he can see um, the potential of that crossing over to Parliament itself and fearing the breakdown of society completely. Because what you have to remember is 
we're in a civil war by this point. Society is already in a mess. <laughs> so, <laughs> it, you know, it didn't need, you know, extra pressure from Cromwell just to, you know. Well, let's talk about one of the biggest things that happens as a result of the civil war, and that's the execution of Charles the First. Um, what is Cromwell's role in this? Cromwell is obviously one of the key people involved. It's not just him. There's there's lots of others involved. Uh, but Cromwell was obviously present at the, the trial of uh, King Charles I. He signed the king's death warrant. His, his name is third down. If you look at the, the death warrant, his, his, his name is third down on the, the first column. So uh, he was one of the first to sign the king's death warrant. Um, so he's he's one of the 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 the, the, the key figures in the, the execution of Charles I. Um, but I think it'd be quite interesting to discuss how the Scottish Covenanters um, sort of reacted to this. Yeah, let's tell us what they thought of all this because this is now moving rapidly away from the document they signed, isn't it? Yeah, they 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 they're absolutely horrified. Um, but they're their reaction, their horrified reaction, is not unusual. Um, because what happens is when Charles I is executed on the 30th of January 1549, this causes widespread revulsion throughout the three Stuart kingdoms and sends shockwaves throughout Europe. England is effectively treated as a pariah state by its neighbours. Uh, and it's because the king is the head of the natural order. He is God's representative on earth, so therefore executing him is truly unthinkable. So, but please remember as well that this took place uh, 140 years before the French Revolution. This is the first time in European history that a monarch has been executed by his own subjects. So this is a big deal. This is a big, big deal. And how did we get here and what, what of Cromwell's role? Well, surprisingly, the Covenanters share some of the blame on this. They didn't mean to, but and they were horrified by what happened. But in order to explain how Cromwell managed to do this, we have to look at what the Covenanters did. And then that explains, obviously, why Cromwell did what he did. Um, so, so basically what happened was, as part of... Uh, the effort to put down a royalist invasion of Scotland in uh, 1648. The Marquis of Argyll in 1649 purged those from the Scottish government who had royalist sympathies or had taken part in the royalist invasion and banned them from holding office. And this was passed in legislation in January 1649. Um, This was probably discussed, although we don't know, um, but we have a an inkling that this was probably discussed with Cromwell when he came to meet the Scottish Covenanters uh, in 1648, in October 1648. And Cromwell thinks, hey, hang on a minute, excluding your opponents from government, that's a great idea. I could try that. So of course, when Cromwell comes back down to England, he goes, oh, that's fantastic. So in December 1648, the royalist engagement, it is decided that by some of the English parliamentarians that Charles Stuart, which they now call that man of blood, could stand trial for his life, and many MPs balked at the idea. So what did Cromwell do? Well, surprise, surprise, he took a leaf out of uh, the Covenanters book, and he purged the House of Commons of MPs that didn't agree with putting the king on trial. And bear in mind, the, Roy- the, the Covenanters had just purged royalists who had invaded England. They hadn't pur- it, it had nothing to do with the king's trial. Where Cromwell is purging MPs here, it is where MPs are resisting putting the king on trial. So the trial is very much a show trial, as other historians such as Sean Kelsey has, has pointed out. And the result is effectively the foregone conclusion. And Sean Kelsey has pointed out that within the trial itself, the English Republic's coat of arms is already displayed on the uh, the wall of Westminster Hall, mm. where the trial took place. Um, 
So how did the Covenanters react to all of this, apart from being utterly horrified? <laughs> well, like many people, I think, perhaps. Yeah, well, basically, um, at the time of the trial, um, Cromwell's Scottish allies did not expect this. They weren't expecting Cromwell to, to go back down to England and execute the king. In fact, the Scots heavily protested this and sent commissioners. Uh, to London, but it fell on deaf ears, and they could not get an audience. It was just completely stonewalled. Um, but at this stage, may I remind you that obviously the Covenanters had signed the Solomon Covenant to preserve the office and person of the monarchy, so they were following and upholding the oath that they had taken under the Solomon Covenant, whereas Cromwell, by putting the king on trial and executing him, was clearly breaking that oath, and um, he decided that he wasn't going to protect the person and the office of the king. So, so that's kind of what happened there. Um, <laughs> he's such a dirtbag, isn't he? Well, yeah, he's he's um, he's obviously very um, he, he's not very principled as far as the Solomon Covenant is concerned. But as I said earlier, he. It took him a few months to sign that document. So I'm not saying he obviously wanted to execute the king back then. That wasn't the case. But he obviously wasn't very keen on being bound by anything, um, a document, a pledge, an oath. Um, so I think that's kind of how Cromwell as a person operates. He's not bound by previous pledges and previous oaths and previous ways of doing things. I'm going back to what you said about him being a wrecking ball. I reckon Steve needs to make that the cartoon for, for this episode, which is Cromwell Miley dressed up as Cyrus. Miley Cyrus. <laughs> well, Cromwell, right. Cromwell allegedly said that necessity has no law. <laughs> and, well, I think that sums up his attitude, really. Well, let's, I think we we obviously, we have Dorman come on, who's Irish, and he would not forgive us, would he, Zach, if we didn't. No, next we've week. got to talk about Drogada, haven't we? We have. I mean, okay. The Irish Royalists revolt in September 1649, unsurprisingly. Drogheda is besieged by Cromwell's men. They're told to surrender. They refuse. After a few assaults, the town is taken. And the civilians, as well as the soldiers, are massacred. Is that an example of Cromwell sort of, if you like, setting an example to the Irish to break their will to resist? Or is there something deeper to it? Yeah, it's it's a very, very curious episode because if you read Cromwell's letter after Drogheda, he 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 um is a very infamous um section of the letter, but he says it's a, a righteous judgment upon those barbarous wretches who've imbued their hands in so much blood. You know how I see it. It always struck me that it's very it's a very dated reaction. It's really medieval and by this point in history it's just not it's not appropriate anymore. It feels like a really old-fashioned, brutal yeah. um, method of dealing with it. Well, this is, again, um, Cromwell's sort of Machiavellian side, um, because he must have known that the majority of people in that garrison weren't Irish, but they were actually English royalists. So the majority of people that were massacred in Drogheda that day were actually... English royalists. In fact, the commander, Sir Arthur Ashton, had his brains beaten out with his wooden leg. Um, Not a pleasant way to go. It's quite an infamous episode. But the majority of, of people killed in Drogheda that day were English royalist soldiers. So you think to yourself, well, wait, hang on a minute. Why is he going on about the barbarous wretches who've imbued their hands in so much blood? It's because... I guess the anti-Irishness carries favour at home. The background to this is that you have the 1641 rebellion, which happens, um, and it's horrible, but it has been blown all out of proportion by the English press. And so this sort of sort of um, bogeyman image of the Irish has has appeared over the course of the Civil War, and. Um, it's it's very much, this anti-Irish feeling is very much prominent amongst the English parliamentarians themselves. And 
uh, so when Cromwell's writing this letter about the barbarous wretches who have imbued their hands in so much blood, I have no doubt he's talking about the Irish here, even though he knows that a lot of the people he's just killed in that garrison were English royalists. Um, because he thinks that, for propaganda reasons, that curries favour back home. Um, and when Cromwell did arrive home from Ireland, he was welcomed as as a as a, a hero, which is which is it's awful to read. But if you read the news books in Marcus Politicus, that's what it says. He was welcomed home with open arms, with people lining the streets in Bristol, and you know people were were welcoming him, welcome, welcoming him back. Um, the interesting part of this is, is what, what Patrick Adair, who is a, a Scottish Presbyterian living in the north of Ireland, what he thinks about this, because of course being Scottish Presbyterian, he's sort of uh, anti-Irish, he's anti-Catholic, just like Cromwell in that sense, but he doesn't like Cromwell either. So he, the way he looks at it is, is that he, he, he says that it, um, Patrick Adair says, um, that the, 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 the faced the, these English royalists. Now, bear in mind, Patrick Adair knows that the people who were killed in that garrison were English royalists. So if he knows they were English royalists, Cromwell must have known they were English royalists, which makes it even more interesting. But what Patrick Adair actually says is that they met justice by unjust hands, meaning they got what they deserved as English royalists because they liked gambling, they liked drinking, um, and that was God's punishment on them for their bad behaviour, but it was done by unjust hands. And Patrick Adair saw Cromwell as an instrument of Satan coming into Ireland, destroying not just um, not just Ireland, but the Protestant church as well. Um, and so it, it's a curious mix. Um, I mean, that was one of the most fascinating things I read about when I was doing my PhD thesis about how he saw um, what was going on in Ireland. And I thought that that was very, very interesting indeed. Definitely. But I'm really keen to get to some of the Scottish stuff because um, we then get the Third Civil War, don't we? Because the, the Covenanters didn't want the monarchy gone, but it's gone. And now mm -hmm. someone's trying to take the monarchy back and Cromwell's lied to them and they're stuck in the middle. And how do they react to all this? Well, immediately after the execution of King Charles I, the Scottish Covenanters declare his son, uh, Charles, as King Charles II of Britain, Ireland and France. And this is very, very important. They didn't say he was King of Scotland, they said he was King of Britain, Ireland and France. So effectively, not only are they upholding the Solomon Covenant by recognising the king and his posterity, the office and the person of the king, and by passing it on to Charles II, they are also, in effect, um, ignoring the existence of the English Republic. They don't, they don't recognise its legitimacy. So the, the Scottish Covenanters, by saying that, are not recognising uh, the English Republic's legitimacy or right to exist. Um, so basically what happens is Cromwell picks up on this, and it is known that the, the, the Covenanters are in talks with Charles II to come over and they're going to build an invasion force and they're going to invade England. Um, now, Cromwell and the English Parliament see what's going on. They can see a momentum building, but Cromwell decides that he'd be better off to have a preemptive strike. Um, and basically that means coming across the border uh, with an English army into Scotland before the Scottish Covenanters have a chance to come across into England. Um, this is what Cromwell does. He, he's come back, he, put the, he comes back from Ireland. There's a quick turnaround and he's up to Scotland by uh, uh, June 1650. And uh, the reaction to this, um, as you can imagine, by Scottish Covenanters is one of absolute um, anger. Yeah, to and, what and, extent and have they had enough of this guy now? 
Well, well, they have. They're they're, they're frustrated. Um, so he he just he just comes across the board. I mean, and Cromwell basically writes pamphlets and letters to the Scottish people saying how he loves them, how this is not an aggressive invasion, how he wants to be friends with Scotland, their fellow Protestants, and they all should, you know, uh, you know, go off into the sunset together holding hands. But that's not how the Scottish Covenanters see it at all. Um, in fact, one of the leading Covenanters, one of the, the sort of um, creators of the National Covenant, Archibald Johnson of Warston was a very prominent Scottish lawyer at the time and Covenanter. And he actually declares Cromwell's preemptive strike as illegal. He declares that Cromwell's invasion of Scotland is an illegal invasion. And it's seen as, as an unwarranted act of aggression, even within standards of the conduct of war at the time. Um, because as Warston argues as a lawyer, he says, he says, Scotland hasn't attacked England yet, so therefore England, you know, shouldn't attack Scotland because they haven't, Scotland hasn't done anything to England yet. Yeah. So, so you know, it's not, you can't claim self-defence because we haven't, we haven't done anything to you yet. So that's, that's the basic argument. And I, to be honest, this, this is, this is where this was the starting point for my PhD thesis back in 2001. Mm. Uh, when that was going on, uh, when I started my PhD, my PhD thesis, it was around the time of the invasion of Iraq, and there was lots of debates about its legality and its illegality. Yeah. And I was watching a, 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 an MP that had to come and stand up and argue for the fact that it was an illegal invasion. And I had, I literally had Archibald Johnson of Orson's diary in front of me. And it was exactly the same arguments as what this MP was arguing in the House of Commons is what I was reading in Warston's diary. And I think to myself, if I hadn't read that, I don't think I would have taken Warston's objections so seriously because Warston complained about everything. He was a constant complainer and a constant warrior, and he was consciously yeah. anxious about everything. But it just struck me when I was watching the, the live debates in the House of Commons at the time, and, was, and I'm going, oh, my God, this is exactly the same argument in a way. It was probably very much the same argument. And I'm thinking, well, maybe Warston does have a point here. So that's where I started to maybe start to think about from a little bit differently. I thought, so maybe, maybe there is a point. See, this is really interesting because he's Cromwell's clearly a great propagandist. He's a bit of a scumbag, likes a preemptive strike. He reminds me of somebody that I spend a lot of time studying myself. But <laughs> rather than rather than going off on a rant about Napoleon, I know one of the things that you've been researching is the treatment of the prisoners of war from this conflict. Tell us a bit about what you found. Well, I haven't. I have. I'm not the one who's actually been researching this, so I won't take credit for this. It's actually. Um, it's actually uh, a group of archaeologists um, who uncovered bodies uh, in, 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 in Durham. Um, uh, they were going to build something new at the University of Durham, and as part of obviously the construction process, they had to uh, they, they found bones and skeletons, so they had to get the archaeologists in to have a look. So this is actually. Uh, to do with this, this major project around the University of Durham. And what they found was that they found uh, bodies of these Scottish prisoners of war. And these, these prisoners of war were prisoners after the Battle of Dunbar, which takes place in September 1650. So Cromwell by this stage has invaded Scotland by June 1650. The Scottish Covenanters and the Royalist Allies clash at the Battle of Dunbar in September 1650. And, uh, the, you know, being war, there are prisoners of war after the battle. And these prisoners are walked from Dunbar all the way down to, to Durham, where they're put in the cathedral. It's kind of like a holding pen for prisoners. And although, uh, according to uh, these archaeologists, they've actually produced a, a great book on it called Lost Lives and New Voices, which I recommend um, your listeners to look at because it, it, it is fantastic. Um, they, they, they have said that although there is no evidence of maltreatment when the Scottish prisoners of war were alive, 
um, when they were buried, they were they were uh, completely stripped naked of all their belongings, and their bodies were just dumped dumped in a pit uh, on top of each other um, haphazardly. So they just dug a big pit and, and shoved all the bodies in there. Um, I was horrified to read this. In fact, when I read this in the book, my heart stopped because I had images flash into my head of, uh, you know, photographic images flashed into my head from the Second World War. I thought, this is awful. And even by the standards of the time, um, it, it was still horrific because prisoners would still receive a Christian burial in the 17th century. Yeah. Um, so this is very, this is, this is, this find is quite horrific. Um, but there are other historians who have looked at the Anglo-Dutch War and historians of the modern Ireland have looked at, you know, uh, Irish, um, the treatment of the Irish prisoners and there are people who've looked at the Anglo-Dutch war have looked at the treatment of the Dutch prisoners and it seems as if the, the prisoners of war weren't treated uh, with due care and attention even by the standards of the 17th century which I know are different from today it's not a case of looking at it from today's perspective and being horrified even from the standards of the 17th century at the time they seem to not been treated with the such due care and attention as they would be um, normally. So for me, the, the parallels with Napoleon are just coming thick and fast here. So off the back of all of this, Scotland is basically forcibly absorbed. It's forcibly absorbed into union with England. Charles II was crowned King of Britain, Ireland and France as per his inheritance, as per his title, as per how it should have been, but the English Republic is effectively very much um, England. It's it's a it's a government that sees a greater England. Um, it doesn't acknowledge Scotland as a separate entity. It doesn't acknowledge, uh, you know, uh, starting not even to acknowledge Ireland as a separate entity. There is this quote by an MP in the middle of the 1650s, who um, called Ireland West England in the Journal of the House of Commons. Um, so, so, yeah, it's a very, very, um, it, it's a regime that doesn't recognise the four distinct con con constituent parts of Britain. It's so really basically, a, to hell with the Welsh, to hell with the Scottish, to hell with the Irish, yes. you're all part of Greater England, England now. Yeah. That's so appalling. Well, it is, so, but what? How much of that is Cromwell? Well, this is the thing. Um, of course, he had his own. There were. There's more to the English Republic than than Cromwell. There's there's other English Republicans within the government. There's there's other figures in there. Um, and so it's not all Cromwell. There's a whole um, raft of MPs. There's a whole raft of you know, a civil service behind Cromwell as a whole sort of government. So it's not just Cromwell. But um, with regards to this idea of a greater England, if I take it back to Scotland, one of the things that happened with the ultimate defeat of the Scots at the Battle of Worcester on the 3rd of September 1651 was that it meant that the whole of lowland Scotland was open to military conquest by Cromwell. So basically, the, the sort of English military um, becomes sort of uh, sort of military occupies Scotland. By 1652, um, the Scottish institutions of government, such as a Parliament and the Committee of the States, they are trying to convene. It's not as if Cromwell's actively the, the soldiers don't actively stamp it out. It's just that as Cromwell's forces are driving north through Scotland, it, it becomes more and more difficult for the Scottish Parliament to convene because usually that would be in Edinburgh, but they can't do that because obviously Cromwell's troops are occupying Edinburgh. Mm. And so they move to Perth and then they find out that they can't convene at Perth. So then they move into Argyll, which is in the sort of West Highlands. 
And they find they can't convene there either. So basically what happens is, is that the Scottish Parliament and the Committee of Estates, it, it just it just it it just just dissipates. People just 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 leave and go to the continent, particularly the Royalists. And it doesn't convene, it just fails to convene. And um and what happens is is that uh they, they, it doesn't reconvene until 1660. So um, that is stage one of that process. So the Scottish Parliament is no more. The Scottish Committee of States is no more. So remember, Cromwell took an oath to uphold the political institutions of both England and Scotland. As well as um, the monarchy. Yeah, as well as the monarchy. <laughs> and in this occasion, he's actually... Um, basically dissolved the Scottish Parliament. Um, and it, it, it's non-existent. Um, it gets worse as well, doesn't it? Because not only is Scotland now not acting for itself, but what you have then is the Anglo-Dutch War. So Scotland effectively being dragged into war against another Protestant nation as a part of England, um, from what you're saying. Uh, how do they react to this? So basically what happens is that uh, with the Anglo-Dutch War, of course, it's a war declared by the English Republic against the Dutch. Of course, Scotland gets incorporated into the English political state, but Scotland has no say in this war whatsoever. It doesn't have uh, an individual voice to dissent from the war. It is just at war with the Dutch by by proxy, really. Um, so it, it, it's, it's a really, really interesting situation. So it, the Anglo-Dutch War of, from 1652 to 1654 is very much an English war. It is representative of English ambitions under the Republic for the domination of the seas and the commercial expansion. But it was a war declared by the English Republic against the Dutch Republic. Furthermore, to say Scotland had no government of its own and could no longer conduct foreign policy or dissent from war. Scotland as being part of the English Republic was uh, by proxy uh, at war with the Dutch too. It has to be said that this was not popular amongst Reformed Protestants, uh, Scots and English alike, including Cromwell, who felt that war should not have been declared against fellow Protestants. However, with the Scots, there's an added dimension. They disliked the uh, English Republic to such a degree that covenanters such as Warriston were cheering the Dutch on from the sidelines, seeing any defeat of the English Republic by the Dutch as God's providence and divine judgment against the very existence of the English Republic. For the Scots themselves, there were varying shades of opinion about the Anglo-Dutch War, which reflected Scotland's complicated relationship with the English Republic. Seeing the opportunity to make money, a handful of Scottish aristocrats, regardless of sympathies, they sold the English Republic large quantities of wood from trees on their estates, which were then turned into ships for the war effort. At the other end of the spectrum, there are Scottish royalists hoping to use the Anglo-Dutch war and the threat of Dutch assistance to help ferment a major royalist rebellion in the Scottish Highlands against English Republican rule, a rebellion which has been known to posterity as Glencairn's Rising. The Dutch themselves were not unaware of the domestic resentment in Scotland towards the English Republic and the fragility of the Cromwellian presence in the Highlands, along with the great pressure of the then Commander-in-Chief of Scotland, uh, Robert Lilburn, and the pressure that he was under. Um, and they were certainly aware of how their presence in the seas could put extra pressure on the English regime. And... Uh, and make the uh, the English public feel more isolated and unpopular. Know that Zach wants to finish off by um, getting your thoughts as someone who grew up idolising Cromwell on on his behaviour across this whole period. But just tell our listeners what the, the Covenanters they became persecuted, didn't they? After the restoration of the monarchy, they kind of their influence sort of declined. Yeah, when Charles II came back, he he really never forgave. The Scottish Covenanters for shoving the Solomon Covenant down his throat as part of his coronation oath in Scotland in January 1651, and he he saw the the covenants as being bad for the stability of um, Britain, 
So therefore, when Charles II came back, he declared the Songling Covenant to be burned by the common hangman, but also declaring anybody who supported the covenants as traitors, and uh, they would be guilty of treason if they promoted the um, can, can I just ask one final question then on Cromwell? Alex isn't going to like this, because for half a second, I'm going to try and give Cromwell the benefit of the doubt. So when you look at Cromwell and this whole period, was he just a massive hypocrite from the outset? Or was all of this something that developed over the course of time and he kind of gets sucked into? No, hypocrite from the beginning. I, go, I call hypocrite, but I, I know nothing about that. This is not my area, but yeah, I can't stand him. Go on, yeah, I, I think I think you have a, have, a, have, a, have a valid point there, Alex, because I think he had a religious conversion what they call a religious conversion. If you look at Puritans and you look at Presbyterians as well, the Scottish Presbyterians as well as the English Puritans, they went through what was called a religious conversion and it's usually um, preceded by some major trauma in their life. Um, Cromwell ended up ill and having to wear flannel and he was majorly depressed and he had a major depressive episode. And then after that, in 1628, he goes through his conversion and he swears that he is godly and he's been saved and that, that he's one of the, the sort of um, godly minority in England. I mean, this is not unusual. John Bunyan goes through the same process. Um, he's, he's a bit like Napoleon in the sense I was reading about how Napoleon was at this Forgive my ignorance, Zach. He was at this battle. I can't remember which one it was. It was one of his early ones. I don't know if it was in Italy or something. And he wins it. And then he suddenly gets this epiphany that he's he's somewhat special, that, that yeah. he's got this destiny, that he's amazing. And you could say that about Napoleon's entire life, to be honest it's with this, you. It's yeah. This, yeah, it's the same thing with Cromwell. He gets this notion in his head that he is destined for greatness. I think I find this, you still get people like this now, don't you? This this kind of distaste that you're so good and so godly um, that it results in you crapping all other over other people. Yeah. I know people that do this because yeah. they've got such a high opinion of their own. And I don't see where the religion comes into it or how it projects all the good things that you like about the religion. And he definitely seems like one of these people. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. As I say, I've definitely changed my perspective on Cromwell, looking at it from the covenanting perspective. Um, I mean, they're not angels either. You can criticise them for a lot of things as well. But I think with Cromwell, they had a valid, they have a valid perspective and they have a valid point. So tell me about your book. <laughs> my book looks at how uh, how the, 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 the Solling Covenant comes about. It, it, it's from a Three Kingdoms perspective, which has never been done before. It looks at how the Solling Covenant comes about, how the, the Anglo-Scottish relationship is, uh, how, how it's all, how it comes together. But also, it really does focus on the church government aspect of it, um, because what what has happened in the past is that um, people have written off English Presbyterianism as if it was um, either that it's non-existent in the sense that England never had its own form of Presbyterianism, which is wrong. Polly has already pointed that out for the 16th century. Elia Vernon had already pointed that out for London. I just ex extended and um, built as much of a system as I could from surviving evidence um, from from all of, over from all over England, and I have actually shown how um, how extensive it was throughout England. But also, as well, I wanted to write something that would give a new perspective on Cromwell. And as I say, because Cromwell's the sort of he's been seen as the proponent of religious toleration, and that's been seen as a a big plus. And the Covenanters, because they disliked everybody who wasn't Presbyterianism, they've been written off as bigots. I think it's too simplistic and wrong. As I've pointed out in this podcast, religious toleration isn't what it actually was. Liberty of conscience was not li religious toleration at all. And although the Covenanters, you could say they were bigots, 
but in fact having one religion one state was actually quite common back then i mean that's why charles the first never accepted any peace proposals because he wanted to be head of the church of england he'd taken an oath to be head of the church of england so in england as far as he was concerned there was only one church for england and that was the church of england and that was it so it's not an unusual position to have um in, in that sense so i yeah i i, I thought it was important to, to talk about it from the covenanting perspective but also what i think is interesting is that currently in the uk we are going through i think we might be going through a period of constitutional change after the pandemic i think we already see change happening um, at the moment we'll see, we'll see where it goes but I've, I've recently written a policy paper which suggests that maybe we should relook at the models of union previous to 1707 between 1603 and 1707 and in particular i looked at the sort of covenanting version of federative union which would mean retaining british structures such as the civil service such as um such as the british military the monarchy would still stay intact all this would stay the same the only difference is that you would have an english parliament and scottish parliament and sort of like the westminster assembly but it wouldn't be religious it would be secular um it would be a secular assembly but you would have a british assembly that that where people would convene from all four 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 parts of the united kingdom so I've kind of gone back to the, the sort of four nations short model, but um, yeah, it'd be interesting to see where the, 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 what happens to the British constitution after this. I think we might be going through a period of change, but we'll wait and see. We'll wait and see. Indeed. Yeah. Kirsten, thank you so much for coming on to talk to us about the Scottish Covenanters and religion in the time of the English Civil Wars. And what, what a wrecking ball. I love that. The human wrecking ball that was Oliver Cromwell. Thank you very much for having me.